Okay, so um, it sounds like today is going to be a little bit of a review for for some of you, and for others, it will be all brand new content. So um, as we're going along, please do interrupt me if you have questions, if um, some of the things I'm saying go against your preconceived notions, or uh, if I'm going too fast or, or whatever, okay? Um, today, from my perspective anyway, is mostly about sort of two things. Background information, so you sort of get a, a firm grasp of how loops actually work. And two, um, if you end up in package development, you will probably want to do most of your looping through base R mechanisms um, rather than per. And that's not to say that you should always do that, but that's that's my preferred approach because then you don't have to have dependencies, right? So when you write a package, you ideally want to limit the number of functions you're using from other packages, because if those packages change, which happens a lot more frequently than base R changes, then uh, it'll, it can possibly break your package, right? And that's annoying because then you've got to go and change your code to fix it. So, um, I try to stick with base R stuff as much as possible when I'm writing packages, and I would encourage you to probably do the same. Okay. All right. So agenda, we're going to talk about for loops to start, and then we're going to talk about the apply family of loops, um, specifically L apply, S apply, and B apply. We won't really get to apply, just the function apply um, at all, actually. And we won't talk about T apply either. Um, I'm not sure T apply is really worth learning at this point. There's so many alternatives and different ways that you can do that. Um, but it might be worth looking into if you need to calculate, um, you know, things like means by group, right? It gives you one uh, a, a one liner to do that rather than you know group by something, summarize mean that sort of thing. Apply. Um, just apply is nice because if you have a matrix in particular, then you can, rather than looping through every column of the matrix or looping through every low, row of the matrix, you just specify a dimension, so rows or columns. And this actually works with, with arrays as well. And then you provide it a summary function. So like, um, you know, loop through the rows and compute the sum or whatever. And there's other functions like row sums that do the same thing. But but uh, apply is probably worth looking into. T apply probably not as much. But we won't really have time for that today. And from my view, they're a little bit less important than these ones up above because you can use those ones up above to replicate anything that apply does anyway. Okay. So the basic learning objectives for today are to understand the basics of what it means to loop through something, um, loop through a vector. So if you already feel comfortable with that, great. Um, and then begin to recognize use cases, right? Because part of what is really nice about the tidyverse, and I'll show you an example of this later, but is that it actually helps you avoid writing loops a lot, right? And so uh, you don't you don't have to end up writing the, the loops, but there are still many cases where you sort of have to write a loop. And um, so recognizing when you need to do that versus using just your existing tool set is, is part of the, the challenge, I guess, and, and part of what I'm hoping to communicate here. Um, and then by the end, be able to use basic for loops and write their equivalents with L apply. So you should be able to write a for loop to do something and then be able to do that exact same thing through L apply. Okay. All right. So the basic basic overview of for loops. This is a little bit small. Maybe I can zoom in on it. Yeah. Um, but basically what this is, this is a really old image I've used a hundred times now. Um, but this is sort of the the essence of a for loop. Okay. So you say for and then you put parentheses, and within the parentheses is sort of the iteration part, right? So then you can say I, or you could say J, or you could say row, or you could say whatever you want, right? I is just a placeholder. Um, 
by convention, by convention, people use I a lot when they're using numbers like this, one, two, three, four, five. And then if you have a second for loop underneath it, you would say for J in and then for K in. But I will say if you're nesting a for loop within a for loop, there's probably a better way to do it. If you're nesting a for loop within a for loop within a for loop, then there's for sure better ways to do it. All right. Um, most of the time, that means just writing a function that does one level of the looping for you, and then you can loop through that function. So then you'll, you're actually doing a loop within a loop, but it's much more clear if one of those loops is its own function. Okay. So anyway, back to this for whatever sort of index thing we have here, and we can call it whatever we want in the vector that you're looping through. Okay, so in this case, it's just an integer vector from one to five. And then here is the body of your loop. And in this case, I'm just saying print some object A and print the ith element. So as it goes through, it's going to first print the first element of I, then, or of A rather, then it's going to print the second element of A, then the third element of A, then the fourth, then the fifth. Okay, so it's going to do this operation five times once for every, um, for however long this sequence is, okay? So here's an exact replica of that, right? I say A, create an object A that has the letters one to 26. So letters is just comes with base R, right? So we have A, B, C, D, D, blah, 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 okay? Then I write my loop for I in one to five, print, a brackets, right? And we use single brackets to um, index a vector. I, and we get A, B, C, D, E. Okay. What I want you to notice here, though, is that this is different than if I just did A brackets one to five, right? Because that would give me a single vector back of length five, right? This one, this loop, gives me five vectors back, each of length one. Does that make sense? So rather than getting one vector back that has A, B, C, D, E, we get five vectors back, and each one has one of those elements. The first one has A, the second one has B, the third one has C, etc. OK? Another basic example, and there's more efficient ways to do this, but that's not the point here, right? We're trying to learn loops. Um, we could simulate tossing a coin and record the results, right? So for a single toss, I might do something like this, right? I'm gonna sample heads and from heads and tails, and I'm gonna do it one time, okay? So when I do this one time, I get tails, cool. Well, what if I wanna do it a bunch of times, okay? Let's say I'm gonna just do it 10 times. This is one way we could do this through a for loop, okay? First, I'm going to do what's called pre-allocating a vector, okay? So I'm going to create a vector here called result, which is just going to be me repeating NA 10 times, okay? So result ends up just NA, 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 10 times, okay? that the length of this is going to be equal to the number of times we want to toss the coin, right? Then we're going to run the trial n times, right? Storing it into our vector. So here we, I say for i in seek along result. So seek along is just going to go one, two, three, four, for however long it is. Result i is going to be sample heads, tails, once, right? So it's going to go through and store the result. Then it's going to do it again and again and again and again until it gets to the end of result, however long result is. OK, questions on that? I have a question that might be kind of a little much. But it, so I've done it both ways, where I've done like an empty vector. And then I've also done a pre-allocated vector. Do you have like a preference or like for like which one would be better? Yeah, so um, generally pre-allocating the vector is going to be the most efficient. Um, it depends on if you have an empty vector, how it ends up working at like how you've specified it. 
but most of the time you just have to be very careful about not growing a vector, okay. right? And so I'll show you in just a second here how much of a difference that can make. So if you have say a list that's empty and then you're just adding elements to the list each time, that's gonna be much slower than having a, an empty list that's already of the same length and then just filling in that list. Okay, awesome, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so growing vectors, this is the next slide. <laughs> So always pre-allocate the vector when you're doing a for loop. Um, you will see things like this on uh, Stack Overflow and stuff. People will say, oh, don't do for loops. They're terrible. They're slow. They're awful. They're not actually slow. Um, that's a myth. They're slow because people write the for loops incorrectly, basically. Um, so there, if you use L apply, you don't have to pre-allocate vectors, and we'll get to that later. But so people will show something with a for loop and then use L apply and L apply is so much faster. But if they just wrote their for loop a little bit differently, they would be equivalent in speed, okay? So um, primarily this means not growing a vector. So here's a, a, a quick example, right? Where I say not allocated and I sample heads and tails. So I'm just sampling it once, right? And then I'm going to um, here in my for loop, so 100,000 times, right? In my for loop, I'm going to just use C to add a new element on there each time, okay? So it's going through there 100,000 times. Each time it's just adding a new element to the vector over and over and over again, okay? So with 100,000 coin flips, that takes about 37 seconds, all right? If I do the same exact thing, but I pre-allocate the vector first, it takes half a second, okay? So that's a huge difference, obviously. And if you are uh, working on bigger problems, then you know it might be because that's right huge for just this simple little example. If it's actually taking, say, ten seconds per loop when you're doing something like this, um, you know, then doing something like this could end up taking you days, whereas this might take like an hour or something like that. Okay, so. Real quick, I'll just walk through this code a little bit more uh, carefully so we're understanding what's happening here. I have this tick and talk code. That's just for the timing. Okay, so this library TikTok, I set the seed at one just so it's it's um, reproducible, and then tick and talk just times it. Okay, so tick starts the timer and talk ends the timer. Then I'm saying not allocated. So I'm just sampling from heads or tails one time. So now I have a vector that says either heads or tails. And then here for I in this big uh, sequence, which I'm subtracting one from because I already have one of the elements, right? The first one. I'm creating a new thing called not allocated, which is the combination of not allocated, this thing, and another sample. Okay, so each time I'm combining and then I loop through and I combine again and again and again. Okay, by contrast, this is the same basic thing, but now allocated is a vector that already has the same length that we're gonna fill in. And now I say allocated I for that same sequence, except I don't have to subtract one now because it's just through the, the thing. And then I'm going to sample heads or tails one time. OK, is that clear questions on that? I have a question. For your uh, placeholder, you have NA. Could you just use like a period instead? Or does it have to be? Yeah, so you could use other things for sure, because you'll overwrite them. But um, NA is generally going to be the most efficient uh, just because there, it's nothing, there's nothing in there. And so it's, it's faster than trying to store a bunch of different information. Other questions? I have a question. I don't, I don't know if this was just asked because my internet just went out and then came back, but um, what's the difference between sequence length and sequence along? Yeah, so... Um, I have that somewhere. Um, so seek, there's, there's seek length, 
like this, right? Which just takes a number. So it's like, if I say seek length 50, it'll give me a vector from, or it'll give me an index that goes one, two, three, four, five to 50, right? Seek along takes a vector. So if I have, uh, you know, like a vector of numbers that has five numbers in it, I say seek along and I give it that vector and it'll figure out the length of the vector and then create a sequence from one to the length of the vector. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. So for example, um, you could say seek length number of columns from a data frame, or you could just do seek along and then give it the data frame. Either one would be the same because the first would calculate the number of columns from the data frame and then it'd be seek length 12 or whatever. And the second one seek along would, uh, because a data frame is a list, it would figure out the length of the data frame and then create a sequence. Any other questions? Okay. All right, so the result is the exact same here. And it's exactly the same, exactly, exactly the same because I used a seed to make sure that the random number generator started at the same place, right? Um, but the speed is obviously not identical. So different ways of writing for loops can result in very different um, speed. And primarily this just means pre-allocating a vector. Okay, so let's have you try. Um, go ahead and launch R if you haven't already. And then base R comes with letters and letters in all caps, okay? So what I'd like you to try to do is write a for loop to create like an alphabet for an elementary school, okay? So it's like A, A, and then B, B, and then C, C, et cetera, okay? So um, A, A here, can be created with paste zero, uppercase letter, right, one, and lowercase letters, one. And so I'd like you to write a for loop to do that for all the letters. Okay, make sense? So we'll just stay in the main group all together, but I'll give you three minutes. Go ahead. My cat's waking up back there. <laughs> okay, uh, so hopefully you were able to get through that. If not, that's okay too. Um, this is how I would do it, okay? So I'm gonna create something I'm calling alphabet and I'm just gonna rep NA the length of characters or the length of letters, right? So I'm just creating an empty vector that has NA for however long letters is, okay? Um, I could also just put 26 in there but generally, I would encourage you to try to use things like this because it's a little more programmatic, right? So um, in this case, it wouldn't happen. But if letters happen to change in length somewhere previously in your code, then this would all still work, right? Whereas if um, you put 26 there and then the length of letters somewhere up above changes, then you might run into bugs or errors here, right? So Anytime you can basically calculate things based off of other objects, that's better to do versus like hard coding something with a, a number. Okay. So then we'll say for I in seek along alphabet. And again, you could say like seek len and then say length letters or whatever. Um, either of those would be the same. Alphabet I, so the ith element of alphabet is going to be paste zero letters i and letters i okay so we're just for every so first it's going to go so the first element of the vector oops first element of the vector is going to be filled in with by pasting together the first one from the uppercase letter and the first one from the lowercase letters okay and then we go all the way through like that does that make sense or the were you successful? Give me a thumbs up if you were successful and a thumbs down if you were not successful. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay, so this is a quick style note. Um, seek along, I mentioned before, uh, but I wanna mention specifically why I'm using that. Because 
the other thing we could do is just use a colon and do something like this, right? Meg, did you have a question? Sorry. Yeah, sorry. It, it's about seek along um, or the other one. Uh, you So you make this vector that you're like, that's empty, right? That you're going to allocate things to. Mm -hmm. Why couldn't you just say seek along and put in that vector? Or like, could you do that? You know, could I say seek along alphabet? Yes. So that's what I did on this one. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. So sometimes I do things one way and other times I do them different way, but uh, they end up the same. <laughs> so, and I, I can't exactly tell you why I did things some one way and a different way another time sometimes. Um, it's just like what feels good to me in the moment as I'm writing that code. Um, but the important part is I think that A, that you are using one of these and B, that it's programmatic, right? So like this sort of thing rather than 26, rather than hard coding it. Good, so why am I using seek along instead of just something like this, right? So if I, I could use a colon, like this is super common, you'll see code like this, like one, two, the length of this thing, right? Whatever it is, X. The problem is seek along is, is generally a little bit safer because of things like this, right? So X, I'm creating an object called X, which is just an empty data frame. So it's a data frame, but it's completely empty. Right? If I say one to the length of X, I get a sequence that goes one, because that's where I'm telling it to go, to zero, because the length of X is zero. Right, So it goes from one to zero. If I say seek along X, well, it's it figures out right away that the length of it is zero, so it just returns nothing. Right, So when I'm actually running a loop, I can, I'll get something like this, right? For I in one to length of X, print letters I, I get A, and then it just stops. Whereas on this one, seek along X, right? There's nothing. And so it doesn't actually do the loop at all, okay? And so uh, that might seem like less helpful, but it actually is generally more helpful because this will end up giving you an error that's usually easier to diagnose, right? Because it's like, oh, this entire loop isn't even running in my code versus why am I getting A here, <laughs> right? Like it, it just doesn't, it very often leads to weird errors that you wouldn't expect, okay? Even better though, and we'll talk about this more later, um, you can put conditions in your loop. And so you could have, uh, if you're specifically if you're using a function, but you could do it actually just in the loop too. You could have it do some checks. So it could check the length of something first. And if it's if it's equal to zero, then it would return an error or whatever. Okay. All right. So another example, let's say we wanted to simu uh, simulate a hundred cases from a random normal distribution, but we wanted to vary the standard deviation of that distribution, okay? So we're getting 100 observations each time, but each time the standard deviation of that distribution is going to be slightly different. So the first time it's going to be a normal distribution with mean of zero and standard deviation of one, that the next time we want to do the same thing, but we want the standard deviation to be 1.2. And then we want to do it again, and we want it to be 1.4. And we want to do this over and over and over and over and over again from, for every standard deviation from 1 to 5 in increments of 0.2. Okay, this is a very typical looping case. Okay, first we could specify a vector that gives us all the standard deviations that we want to loop through. Okay, so we have our increments from 1 to 5 by 0.2. Okay, then we're going to allocate a vector that is the same length as increments, okay? You could do this a bunch of different ways. You could create a, a data frame. You could create a matrix. I'm going to do it in a list. I think lists are often the most easy uh, way to do a lot of this stuff. And then from there, you can put it in other formats, okay? So I'm creating a list now here 
that is an empty list that is the same length as increments. Okay, there's different ways to do this. If you're creating an empty list, this is, I think, the best way to do it, um, but others are fine too. But say vector, vector, which you can create any type of vector with that function, but the type of vector you want to create is a list. Okay, and then it's just going to be the length of increments. Okay, and part of what I think is nice about taking programmatic approaches to this also is I don't actually know how long increments is, but it doesn't matter, right? I'm having it calculate it for me. So then when I look at this, I have an empty list of length 21 that just has a bunch of nulls in it, okay? Then I'm gonna write my for loop, okay? So I'm gonna say for i in seek along simulated, Okay, simulated being my empty list. Simulated double bracket I, so fill in each element of that list with this. Okay, so now I'm saying random normal, get 100 draws from a random normal distribution that has a mean of zero and has a standard deviation of increments. Okay, Point two, one, it starts out at one, then 1 1.2, then 1 1.4, then 1 1.6. And each time it does that, I get a hundred draws from it, right? So now when I look at the structure of the simulated object, it's still a list, but each one now has a hundred observations in it, okay? So each element of the list now, rather than being null, is an atomic vector of type double of length 100, okay? Does that make sense? Questions on that? Okay. Because it's a list and because every element of the list is the same length, we can very quickly switch this to a data frame. Okay. All we want to probably do first is give the data frame names. Okay. So um, I'm saying that uh, we want the names of simulated to be equal to paste zero SD underscore, right? Standard deviation of increments. So it's gonna create things that look like this. So that's gonna be the names of the list. And then when I call data dot frame on simulated, I get a data frame that looks like this, okay? So now we went from a list to a nice data frame really quickly. And, uh, but I think a list is easier to actually work with when you're doing the looping. So tidyverse, one of the best things about the tidyverse, as I mentioned before, is that it does a lot of the looping for you. So you don't have to do it, okay? Um, anytime you're using a group by, basically it's doing a loop in the background, okay? Um, so here, I'm not gonna go through this code, but this is just to move it to a longer format, right? And then I go ggplot, geom density, make the color equal to the standard deviation and I get a plot that looks like this, right? So here's a whole bunch of lines. I omitted the legend because it's way too many colors anyway. Um, but you can see the density of the distribution, right? According to these different standard deviation units. Cool. So this is Jenny Bryan quote that I've always liked because I think it's super relevant. Somebody has to write loops. Doesn't have to be you, but, uh, in some cases, it probably will have to be you. <laughs> and so that's why we're talking about all this, OK? All right, so what about a base R method of doing the exact same thing we just did with ggplot, right? So if we were in the base R world, we would probably have to write a loop to do this, OK? So this is how I would do it. And again, this might start to feel redundant because that's kind of how for loops are. It's sort of the same thing over and over and over and over again. But I'm going to create an empty vector, I'm creating a list again, that is the length of SIMD. Okay, SIMD was my simulated object, right? And length, uh, so coming back here real quick, SIMD is actually my data frame, right? But if I say length on a data frame, I'm going to get the number of columns in the data frame because it's a list under, underneath it, right? So each element of the list is a column. Does that make sense? So I could also say in call 
SIMD, but, but length is actually a little bit more um, specific. And in call would have to be what you would use if you were using a matrix, but uh, for a data frame, length is probably a little bit more accurate. Okay. Then we'd say for I and seek along densities. So I'm seeking along this thing I just created. Densities, double bracket I, so each element of the list is going to be the density of the ith column for SIMD. Okay, so I'm getting the ith column and I'm calculating the density from SIMD. Then I look at the structure of the densities and each of these are density objects now. Okay. And these can be plotted with base R very easy, right? So I say plot densities, double bracket one, that's gonna give me a plot of the density for that first column, okay? But what if I wanted all of them? Well, then I've got to write a loop again, okay? So I've extended the X limit range here, okay? To be negative 20 to 20, but then I'm saying for I in a sequence from two to the length of densities, I'm doing two because I don't want to over, I don't want to draw that first one again, right? Lines where the X is equal to densities I X and the Y is equal to the densities I Y. Okay, and we get all of those lines. Does that make sense? Questions on that? Okay. This is, um, just pause here for a second to say, if you're not, familiar with looping, like if you haven't done it before, this is probably feeling like, whoa, <laughs> right? Like this is a lot of stuff. And that's okay if you're feeling that way. We are going to practice this a lot, okay? Um, but it is very new and very different way of thinking about this kind of stuff. All right, a couple of things that are not really the most important, but I think they're worth mentioning. Um, so on the prior slide, I said a sequence from two to the length of densities, okay? You can also skip iterations in, in a loop, okay? So here's an example where I'm skipping. I'm saying if I is equal, equal to one, then just next, skip it, okay? Otherwise, do this stuff, okay? And that allows me to just do seek along here rather than a sequence from two to whatever, okay? Um, you might also want to do that if there's like, you know, I don't know, maybe you have a negative, negative values and you don't wanna, or maybe you have something where you're dividing by, by a number, right? So you have a, a sequence of numbers and that ends up the denominator in the thing that you're calculating. So you might wanna say, if um, the denominator equals zero, then next, right? Because it couldn't divide by zero. Questions on that? Okay. And here's just another example where you can break a loop. Um, for for loops, this is not particularly important. For other loop, other base R loops that we won't really talk about too much, but like a, a while loop or um, a, a repeat loop, you have to have a break because it, they sometimes they they won't break until a condition is met. Okay, so here's a quick example. So for loops generally will just run out, but you can run into for other types of loops. You can run into infinite loops where it will just run and run and run and run and run and run and run forever like literally forever, unless you manually break it. And that's because you have to have a condition in those types of loops to tell it to break and it'll keep running until that condition is met. And if that condition is never met, it just keeps going, okay? Um, but for for loops, we might wanna do something like this, right? So we're having a random uniform vector of type double. Um, and I'm saying if any rand uniform is greater than five, then break. So it's going to sample from a, a uniform distribution from zero to 10. And then if it gets to any of them that are greater than five, it's just going to break. Okay. So then here's what the output looks like. We get 2.6, 3.7, 5.7. And then this one's greater than five. 
So it breaks. And then we just have the rest of them are zeros from our vector that we allocated up here. Okay. Make sense? All right. So that's what that's pretty much it for for loops. We will um, practice them more, but we're now going to move on to the apply family of loops. So before I do that, I just want to pause one more time. Um, are there other questions on any of that? Okay, so we're moving on to the apply family of loops. Um, these, so L apply is from, from my view, sort of the fundamental apply uh, function, okay? It's one of numerous what are called functionals or what Hadley anyway way refers to them as functionals, okay? And a functional takes a function as an input and returns a vector as output, okay? So, the thing that is really nice about L apply is regardless of what you're iterating through, it makes no difference. Whatever you iterate through, it will always return a list, always, okay? And so it's very predictable in that way, you know what the output is going to be. Revisiting our simulation. Okay, so we're going to do the same simulation we did before, but we're gonna do it with L apply this time, okay? So here's the for loop version, right? We have our increments sequence from one to five by 0.2, and then simulated, we're pre-allocating our vector, right? And then we say for i and seek along simulated, simulated double bracket i is r norm. We're getting 10 this time instead of 100, the mean of zero and standard deviation according to increments i, okay? And then we get this list return, all right? So there's the for loop version. Now we're going to do the exact same thing using L apply. And it looks like this. Okay. We create our increments object here. And then we say L apply. We're just going to loop through that increments object and apply some function, which I'm giving this function in this case the argument SD. And then I say R norm 10. So 10 observations with mean of zero and a standard deviation according to SD, okay? And we get sim L, this is our output. It's the exact same as the other one, okay? So this is considerably less code, right? But it's doing the exact same thing. So contrasting again, this versus this. Okay, and we could actually, I did actually originally have, um, we could just take this sequence and put it here instead of first creating increments and putting then putting it there, right? So you could basically do that entire for loop that we did before in one line. You don't have to pre-allocate vectors. Um, you just pass it a vector that you're gonna loop through and then tell it the function that you want it to apply. And that's it. Hey, Daniel, I have a question on passing the arguments there. It looks like in L apply, you, the second argument is both a function and our norm. What? What's yeah, that? so this is actually all one argument. Oh, um, okay. Oh, yeah. And I, I uh, will show you other examples that might make this a little bit more clear, but you can also say function SD here, and then you could put uh, curly braces here and then use a return and put whatever you want to loop through down here and then end curly braces, right? So basically gotcha. you are, in this case, um, you are looping through increments and the function that you're applying is actually what's called an anonymous function, okay? So it's a function that you're creating right here in L apply. You're creating this function that has one argument, SD, and it's being passed to R norm right there. Okay. Gotcha, thanks. And Daniel, I had a question. So each value of SD is just, or sorry, so SD each on each iteration is just a value of increments? Correct. Okay, thank you. Yep. So the first time through we get one. So we're getting, this is 10 observations from the standard deviation of one, 10 observations from the standard deviation of 1.2, 10 observations from a standard deviation of 1.4, et cetera. Other questions?
Okay. More examples. So um, we can loop through a data frame super easy, right? Because remember, a data frame is just a list. So if we can loop through a list, we can loop through a data frame doing the exact same thing. Okay. So go ahead and follow along here, please. Um, we're going to load the Palmer Penguins data set. And then we're going to use lapply on penguins. And the function I'm going to loop through is just is.double. So here, I don't have to pass anything else. I'm just saying for every element in penguins, test if it's double. Right? So this is the vector I'm loop looping through, which happens to be a data frame. But a data frame is a list. And the function we're applying is is.double. Okay? And because we're using lapply, we always get a list in return. And that list is logical where it's saying it's telling us for each column if that column is of type double. Okay. We can use lapply on empty cars and say mean, right? So that's going to give us the mean of every column of empty cars. And we can add conditions. Okay, so this is as we talked about before, um, but a little bit more of an applied, like real example, right? So before I was having, I was showing you how to break out of loops and how to skip iterations. You can also just add conditions like this, which are fairly common that you'll want to do, right? So I'm going to say, I'll apply penguins, and I'm going to apply this function x, okay? X in this case now just becomes a placeholder for every column that I'm looping through. Okay, so X is the column in this case. And I'm saying if is dot numeric X, so if the column is numeric, then do this part. Give me the mean of X. Otherwise, it's going to do, it's going to skip over this and it's going to give me nothing. Okay, so for species and island, I just get a null in response because. They're not numeric, and so it just skipped right over them, and we get null. For all the rest of them, those are numeric, and so we actually get the mean back. Does that make sense? Questions? I'm wondering, is there a rule of thumb when you use bracket or not to wrap out the function? Is that just based on the lens of it? Yeah, so you're talking about these curly braces? Yes, yes. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it is related to the length. Um, if it's a short one, like back here, right? If it's really short, then I would just keep it all in line. But if it gets longer at all, then I would break it out like this. Okay. And when you're doing conditions like this, I would always have them broken out by the uh, curly braces. So you need a braces if you use it in a new line, is that? Yeah, you actually don't have to. Again, you could have if is dot numeric x and then just have mean over here. Oh. Um, but I would, my personal style preference is to wrap the whole thing in here because that I think makes it a little more clear that it's not just a line that's being tested, it's this block. And that block is only computing the mean but in many other cases might have lots of other things in it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So here we get, we run the loop, just to reiterate, we're running the loop where we're looping through each column of the data frame. We're testing if that column is numeric. If it is, we're computing the mean, otherwise it's just returning null. We could also add a second condition, okay? So this is now getting quite complicated. And this is not something I would expect that you would, you know, do right away, but I did want to show you an example. Okay. So I have, I have L apply, I'm looping through penguins and I'm applying this function X. Okay. Then within the loop, I'm saying if X is numeric, then return the mean. Okay. I have to use this explicit return here because otherwise it's going to try to continue on with the loop. Okay, and I don't want it to do that. I just want it to stop the loop and just return this thing. Okay, so if X is numeric, it's going to return the mean. Else, 
if is dot character or is dot factor x, then return the table of x. And if it's anything else, if it's not numeric and it's not character and it's not factor, then which is means logical is the only thing that's left, right? Um, but then it will just skip over it entirely. And so now in this case, we get a pretty nice summary of our data frame in return, where we have a table uh, with the counts, if it's not numeric. And if it is numeric, we get this, the mean back. And again, you know, there's lots of functions that will do similar sorts of things for you. But this is a way that you can do it on your own. And it hopefully sort of illustrates the concept, which is we're looping through this data frame. And for each column, we're first testing if the column is numeric. And if it is, we're doing one thing. If not, then we're doing a second test to see if it's character or factor. And if it is, then we're doing a second thing. And if it's not, then we're just returning null. And it, nothing gets evaluated. Questions on that? Okay. All right, we can also pass arguments directly with LApply, which um, can lead to even a little bit more uh, concise syntax. Okay, so here I'm using error quality data set, right, which is part of base R. And it's, it's nice because um, it has some missing data. Uh, actually, so does the Palmer Penguins one. So I probably should have just stuck with that. But I went with air quality because it's all numeric, but there is missing data in it, right? So if I say L apply air quality, I could say, give me the mean of every column. But because we have that missing data, we want to pass an additional argument, OK? So I have the thing I'm looping through first, and then I have the function that I want to apply to each element of that vector, OK? If I want to. I can now include additional arguments to that function immediately following the function that I've provided. Okay, so I'm saying mean is the function I'm going to apply, and na.rm equals true is an argument to this function, right? And I only have one additional argument here, but if you look at the help documentation for L apply, it will have like x as the vector that you're looping through fun for the function that you're going to apply. And then the third argument is just going to be dots. It's going to be dot, dot, dot. And that's a, basically a placeholder for any additional arguments you want to pass to the function. So I have na.rm equals true here, but I could have 15 additional arguments to the function that follow this, and they can all just be passed directly through LApply like this. OK? So going back to our simulation, we could also do something like this, right? We have L apply. We're going to seek along these standard deviation numbers. We're going to apply the function R norm. R norm only takes three arguments. There's only three arguments that you can pass to it, the n, the mean, and the standard deviation. So I'm defining here what the n is, and I'm defining what the mean is. So the only thing that's less left is the standard deviation. So it's going to use our norm and fill in the standard deviations with these values. So now we've gotten really abbreviated, right? And I would actually argue that this is maybe a little too clever, right? It's sort of harder to see what's actually going on here, I think, than in the previous example where we explicitly said SD is equal to this, right? Um, that's a common problem. It's like, you know, you have sort of generally this tension between writing concise syntax and writing clear syntax. And those things are not always necessarily the same thing. Okay, um, please follow along with this part as well. We're gonna take the empty cars data set and we're gonna split it by sill, okay? By the number of cylinders. So what I'm doing here is I'm creating an object called by sill. And when I say split empty cars by this other vector, all it's going to do is give me a list in response where each element of the list is the thing with that specific value. So I have empty cars sill here. 
this first element is going to be only the rows of empty cars where sill is equal to four. The second one is only the rows where sill is equal to six. And then I have one more um, element of that list, which is a data frame where it has only the rows where cylinder is equal to eight. Okay, Does that makes sense. So basically we took a data frame and we took a column from that data frame, sill, which has the values four, six, eight, and we split it into a list where we have now three data frames, one data frame for each unique instance of sill. Okay. Does that make sense? Questions on that? Okay. Now, because we have this list object, we can loop through by sill, the object we created back here, and we can compute some things, right? So I say function x, give me the mean of x. x is now a placeholder for the entire data frame, right? Not a column but the entire data frame because we're looping through that by sill, which is data frame, data frame, data frame. So when I say function X, it's going to be a placeholder for the specific data frame. And then I say X dollar sign MPG, that's going to give me the MPG column for the corresponding data frame. All right. So when I say loop through by sill and give me the mean of X dollar sign MPG, I now get the mean MPG for four cylinders, mean MPG for six cylinders, and the mean MPG for eight cylinders. Questions? Okay, so now your turn again. I'd like you to try to do, to mimic that exact same thing, but using Palmer penguins, okay? So using Palmer penguins, split the data set by species. That should be in blue. Messed up. Um, split the data set by species and calculate the average bill length millimeters. Okay. Four minutes. Go ahead. Okay. Hopefully you were successful. Um, I apparently didn't have the column to do it here. I thought I did. Um, but the process would be exactly the same as we did here, right? So I'd, I would say create something I would probably call it by underscore species. And then I would say split penguins and then penguins dollar sign species. That would give me a list with a data frame for each species, right? And then I would say L apply by species function X uh, mean X dollar sign bill length millimeters. Okay. That should do it for you. Did anybody have um, problems doing that? Or were, were there issues you couldn't resolve? Uh, just want to double check the result. So I got three results Adelie non applicable, only chin strap. 48.8 and Ginto is also non applicable. Is that the same result with others? So, my guess is you probably have missing data. So, you probably want to do na.rm equals true in there, and then you'd have values for all three. Uh, okay. I had the same thing, and I was wondering where would you put the na.rm equals true? Yeah. So, uh, you would put it right here because it's in a within mean. So you'd say calculate with mean, right? Calculate the mean of X dollar sign MPG in this case, but then you'd say comma na dot rm equals true. Thanks. Yep. Other questions, clarifications? Okay. We can also <clears throat> do something like this where we're using by sill again, but we're going to actually create separate plots for every cylinder. Okay, so here I'm looking at the relation between engine displacement and miles per gallon for every um, 
for every cylinder. Okay. Um, all right. Sorry, I'm just looking, checking in on the chat. So I'm gonna bring this over here. Okay. Um, so when I do that, it's going to loop through the bicyl thing, right? And the data that it's gonna is gonna be supplied it to ggplot is just the data frame from each of those each element of the list. And then I get something back like this, right? So this is the relation between engine displacement and miles per gallon for four cylinders. This is the same thing, but for six cylinders. This is the same thing, but for eight cylinders. Okay. So let's try this again, another four minutes. Um, try to do the same thing, but produce separate plots for the relation between bill length and body mass for each of the species, okay? Okay, did people have troubles with that? Were you successful? Questions? Okay, good. It should be basically the exact same as this, but you'd be looping through your bispecies instead, and then you'd put your variables here. Met. Okay. Okay. Saving. Um, you can extend this example further by saying, okay, I want to now save every one of these plots. And in this case, right, we're only producing three plots, but it's very regular for me that I will have, you know, 20 plus plots at that I want to write out at the same time. Okay. And so a loop is really, really helpful for this. Using functionals like lapply um, would require parallel iteration, which we haven't gotten to yet. Um, there's a, a function in base R called map with a capital M, um, which is what I would probably use. There's also M apply, but that's a simplified version of it, map. Um, but you can extend this fairly easily with a for loop. Okay, so first we're gonna do something like this, right? I've, I'm going to create my plots and I'm actually going to save those plots in an object, which I'm calling plots, right? So we're looping through by sill, applying a function X, where X just becomes a placeholder for the data. And then we're going to create that plot, right? So this gives us those three plots. And then we're going to create a vector called file names, right? And those file names are just, it's just going to be the pathway where we want to save each of these plots. So the way I would do this is say here, here, plots, assuming I have a directory called plots. If not, I would run this line of code first, create a plots folder in my current directory, right? Or at the root of my current directory. And then um, I would say paste zero, sill, and the names of by sill, and then dot PNG. So I'm gonna save them all out as pings, okay? So this would be sill four, sill six, sill eight, dot PNG. Okay, so now I have these three paths in addition to the three plots that I created. And I'm going to loop through and say for I in seek along plots. I could also do seek along file names, right? I'm going to say gg save file names I and plots I. Device is going to be ping, and then I specify width and height there, and then we're good. Okay. The, Part of where this gets tricky though, is with file names, right? File names is just an atomic vector. It's a character vector. And so we're gonna just use single brackets to index that one. Whereas plots is a list because we used lapply to create it, right? So lapply is always gonna return a list. So we have to use double brackets to get to the actual plot from it. Because if we use single brackets, we're subsetting the list rather than getting the elements from the list, okay? So this single bracket, double bracket distinction takes some getting used to for sure, but just try to keep in mind if you're dealing with a list and you want the contents of the list, then you have to use double brackets. If you wanna subset the list to give a list in return that has say the third, fifth and ninth elements of the list, then you would use single brackets, okay? All right, we're gonna skip that. Um, because I want to get to this part, um, you can try this on your own later if you want to, all right? But I want to talk about the variants of L-apply, specifically S-apply and V-apply. And 
I've spent almost all the time up to this point on L apply because, as I said, I think it's the most important. Okay, S apply and V apply are just variants of L apply that simplify the output. Okay, so S apply will try to figure it out on its own and it will simplify the output if possible. And if not, it will just return a list. Okay, so when I say simplify, I mean rather than returning a list, it might return an atomic vector of type logical or of type double or whatever. Okay, because it's going to look at all the elements of the list. And if they're all the same, it'll just return a vector. If they're all the same and they're all of the same length, and that length is not one, it will return a matrix. So you can get a matrix in return that's n, you know, the number of rows equal to the number of iterations, and then the number of columns equal to the length of each output. Okay. So I think S apply is totally fine for interactive work, and there's nothing wrong with using it at all for interactive work. But if you're getting to programming, so you're writing functions and things, I would absolutely avoid it like the plague, right? It's not something you want in functions. And you'll see it in people's functions for sure a lot, but I would not use S apply in a function because it's unpredictable. Sometimes it will turn a, return a vector. Sometimes it will return a list. Sometimes it will return a matrix or an array, right? And there are times when you can program it up so you can figure out what the output is gonna be from S apply. But better is to just use V apply, which we'll talk about here in just a second, okay? So I guess right now. So V apply is the alternative to S apply that also simplifies the output, but it's strict and you specify what that output is going to be, okay? So you say, I'm expecting an atomic vector of type double from this loop. And if it's anything else, it will error, okay? And so that seems problematic because it's like very strict, right? But that's much, much better when you're talking about trying to program a function to do something. If it's not that output, then you know that's where your error is and you need to diagnose why that is happening, okay? Um, so if you're writing functions, for sure use that, or you could consider using per. Um, I actually think if you're only using per as a dependency in your package, you're in great shape. And you know you can use other functions too in your packages as well, but just be aware the more uh, functions you're importing from other libraries, the more likely your package will break over time. Okay, so some examples. From our simulation, right? I'm doing the exact same thing I did before, but I'm just putting the sequence in here. And then now I'm using, oops. Now I'm using curly braces to put the body of the loop here, right? So I'm saying R norm 10 with mean of zero and a standard deviation of X. The class I get back in response is um, a matrix, okay? And I think I said this backwards just a second ago, but we end up with 21 columns one for each iteration. And then the number of rows is equal to the length of the output, which is 10. Okay, so the length of the output for each iteration is 10. And so we get a matrix uh, with the dimensions 10 by 21. Okay. We can also do this with testing for our data frame, right? So S applied penguins is dot double, and we get a logical vector in return. So this is super nice, false, false, true, true. It's just a vector, one vector that gives us um, the logical test that we were evaluating. Now that that's a vector, you can actually use that for subsetting. So you could do things like this. Penguins, right, take all the rows, and then for the columns, s apply penguins is dot double. That's going to loop through all of the columns and test if it's type double. If it is, it'll return true. Otherwise, it'll return false. So this is a logical vector of trues and falses that's the same length as the number of columns of the data frame. And it's only going to return those columns where this is true, right? So we get only two columns here because these ones are integers. So um, I'm gonna skip this also, but we could also do the opposite of this. Say, so give me all of the columns that are not of type double. But the way we would do this is a little bit different than you might expect, right? 
you might expect that you would put like a um, exclamation point right here, right before is dot double. That actually won't work, okay? You could say function x and then exclamation point is dot double x and that would work. But this is returning, this s apply here is returning this logical vector, okay? So if I put the exclamation point actually right before the entire loop, then it will just reverse this output. Okay, what's returned from the vector, it will reverse that. And so we would do something like this. Okay, that's maybe a little bit confusing, but it's basically you're taking this is the output, which is that previous logical vector. And then this exclamation point is just reversing that. So all the trues becomes, become falses, all the falses become trues. Okay, only one minute, um, but we'll talk about V apply very quickly. Um, so simplifying can be super, super helpful, right? Really, really helpful, but it's not ideal for programmatic work because it's unpredictable. So V apply solves this problem by having you specify the output, okay? So here I say empty cars, mean, and then this is a required argument, fun.value, and you tell it the type of output that should be returned and the dimensions. So one just means it's going to be an atomic vector. Okay. On that other one that I had where it returned a matrix, you could do the same sort of thing where you would say double. And then in here, you would say 10 comma 21. And that would return a matrix. I almost never do that. I pretty much always return atomic vectors. So it's just whatever type I want. And then one. Okay. If I say v apply penguins is dot double, so that's going to be a logical, right? And I say fun dot value equals character, I get an error because it's expecting type uh, character, but the result is type logical. Okay, and then it will also do some coercing if it if it can. So here I'm doing logical, and I get exactly what I would expect but it does do coercion, right? So here I'm doing is.double, that's a logical test, but I'm saying I want my output to be double. So it's just taking those logicals and switching them to double, and then we get that, okay? So um, there's a bunch more examples of this. We can go through these last couple of slides for the first couple of minutes of class on Wednesday, but Wednesday will be the lab where we will actually practice applying all of this stuff. Okay. Um, if you have specific members you'd like to work with in your lab, uh, please send those to me. Um, if you want it to be the same people, I'll just make them the same people as your final group. If you've um, given me those names, if you haven't, then uh, please try to do that before Wednesday, and then I will um, put you in those groups. Otherwise, I'll just randomly assign you. Okay. All right. Any last minute questions? Okay, thank you everybody. I will see you on Wednesday.